years ago when the Earth System Governance Conference was held in Canberra, um, I had a conversation with uh, Frank Beerman in connection with the, the, the initiation of the New Directions Initiative, um, which was of course designed to uh, develop a new science plan. Um, and I confessed to him that I'd never actually read the old science plan, um, even though I was a member of the Scientific Steering Committee, and he, he was quite horrified. Um, so I, I took that lesson to heart and thought, well, uh, okay, from now on, everything I do is going to be consistent with the new science plan. So uh, th if, if, you, if those of you who are at the New Directions uh, presentation on uh, plenary on, um, on uh, uh, Monday evening, um, if you remember that matrix, um, then uh, one of the lenses, uh, a bifocal lens on the left-hand side was of architecture and agency. This paper is all about agencies, who will, who will form. Uh, and then on the bottom, you have the Anthropocene, and the intersection there, you have um, exactly the topic of this paper, um, agency and Anthropocene, who will form the Anthropocene. And that's what this is, this is, this is about. Um, agency is simply the capacity to think and then act. We can think of individuals as agents, but we can also think of group agents. Um, in the background of this paper is a categorization of different kinds of agents, which I developed in a paper called Democratic Agents of Justice, published in the Journal of Political Philosophy a couple of years ago. Um, Honora O'Neill, uh, around 20 years ago, in contemplating theories of justice, suggested that uh, any theory of justice is radically incomplete without an account of the agents who will put it into practice. And so that's, that's where the where, where the importance of agency comes from, at least in political theory. Um, however, uh, for O'Neill, agents were those under obligation to promote justice. What she missed was a particular kind of agent who will give form to what justice should mean in particular contexts. That is what I would call formative agency. Okay, okay. so that is what I would call formative agency. Um, so form formative agency is the capacity to give shape to principles to be adopted in particular contexts. From the point of view of this paper, the important question is how do agents, um, how, do, how, do agents give how do agents give form to the Anthropocene? Um, how are meanings of justice, sustainability, and democracy determined when it comes to when, when, it comes to, when it comes to giving shape to the Anthropocene. Um, the, this is going to be one chapter in a book by Jonathan and myself, which is on a contract with um, Oxford University Press. Um, as you will see, there is a, this is chapter six of that, of that book. Um, there is a chapter on democracy, uh, which we haven't, uh, uh, haven't drafted yet, but that's ne next on the agenda. Um, so to just to give a, um, an example of how formative agency operates, um, consider how meanings of biodiversity uh, get changed over time. Biodiversity as a concept really first appears in the, um, in the 1980s as a contraction of biological diversity. Um, scientists, uh, um, biological scientists are very, very important in that. Uh, conservation biologists um, in, in particular. Um, the International Union for the Conservation of Nature plays a role in getting the, uh, the, the concept um, accepted. Um, with time, there is, uh, there is debate over whether biodiversity should be measured simply by counting species um, in particular, particular contexts, including the global one, or whether we should worry more about functional diversity within e e ecological systems. Um, as time, uh, as time goes further along, economic thinking enters into, into biodiversity, and the uh, the, the, the idea of um, ecosystem services um, gets paired with biodiversity, for example, in the um, intergovernmental platform on bio uh, uh, biodiversity and e ecosystem services. Um, that proves controversial. Um, more traditional conservation biologists push back against that because it means that, uh, uh, that nature, it, it implies that um, nature can be traded off uh, uh, against more conventional economic, economic values. Um, so there is a um, so the, the, and, and the debate continues um, within the within IPBES, um, Recently, there has been uh, some questioning as to whether ecosystem services ought to be central, or whether instead um, we should um, speak more broadly of nature's contribution to people, uh, without necessarily monetizing it. Um, so uh, all of these all of these um, all of these contributions are, are in a sense um, 
uh, that they all involve the exercise of formative agency. Um, they involve many different actors um, contributing to the ever-evolving meaning of biodiversity, which then, uh, uh, um, which is then, uh, you know, to take taken as a, as, a, as a principle for for global and, and local action. Uh, more rec well, recently, um, in the the literature on planetary boundaries. Uh, uh, biodiversity loss in the in the most recent iteration published in 2015 uh, biodiversity integrity is specified as a planetary boundary as opposed to biodiversity loss which appeared in the um, the original version so all the all these are examples just um, of how a concept evolves over time um, and how uh, um, how this is how, how this how this 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 kind of process gives um, gives place to um, ever yeah, ever evolving principles for action uh, Okay, next, how to exercise formative agency. Um, okay, sorry, I should have, that was the last slide. Okay, how to exercise formative agency. Um, so there's at least, uh, at, at least three ways. Um, formative agency is almost always accompanied by language. Um, even things like um, protest, leading by example, um, violence, coercion, which can um, enter into uh, um, enter into the exercise of formative agency, are always almost um, accompanied by language. Um, language, in turn, can be uh, uh, can be classified into um, well at least at least three forms. Um, first is reason or argument, um, and some, sometimes this does. Um, this does fake, take effect in, um, in, in determining principles to be adopted. Um, so, um, for example, um, consider, consider the work of um, Peter Haas and others on the importance of epistemic communities in international, in, in international governance. Um, that, uh, the, the, an epistemic, uh, the idea of an epistemic community uh, suggests that reason and argument are central. Um, in Haas's case, it's uh, argument, ar argument rooted in science, which forms the... Uh, the, 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 the core activity of, a, of, a, of an epistemic community, at least as it takes effect in, in global governance. Um, one of um, Haas's examples is the, uh, the uh, 1987 um, Montreal Protocol for Protection of the Ozone Layer. Um, but as Karen Litvin um, remind, reminded us, uh, rhetorical moves were also important um, when it came to the uh, um, uh, when, when it came to the to the to the, um, to the adoption of the of, of the protocol, and important and, and in particular the rhetorical force of the ozone hole idea. Um, so rhetoric matters. Um, we can think of uh, well, just looking at the history of global environmental affairs. Uh, uh, Grohal and Brundtland was uh, a very effective rhetorician in establishing the in, in getting the idea of um, sustainable development. Um, adopted as a dominant discourse in, um, in global environmental affairs. Um, Brundtland really asserted the idea of sustainable development with, uh, with, with great force, uh, but didn't necessarily argue for its key tenets that, um, that, justice, uh, uh, that, 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 that justice, conservation, um, and economic growth could, could go together. It was just asserted with great force throughout her, her report. Um, uh, deliberation involves the exercise and reception of um, Persuasion. Um, so this uh, this this involves the so this um, so whereas uh, reason, well of course deliberation can also involve um, reason argument and, and rhetoric, um, but it but it emphasizes uh, the the the, in, the, inter, the 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 interactive processes which um, productively can productively um, combine reason argument rhetoric and other forms of communication. Um, so if we so can we find examples of this in global environmental governance? Um, we we can occasionally find hints of it um, even though. Uh, global, global governance processes are typically quite a long way from deliberative, deliberative ideals. Um, so, for example, um, if we look at the, um, the, the uh, uh, recent um, issue of in environmental politics on non-state uh, non actors in, glo in, in, in global climate governance, um, we see um, the, uh, the introduction by uh, Backstrand et al. Um, and some of the papers uh, uh, looking at the development of um, hybrid multilateralism um, in connection with the, uh, the the 2015 Paris Agreement, um, and we can sort of discern um, some deliberative elements in uh, uh, in, uh, in in the in, in the development of um, hybrid multilateralism as a reaction against uh, uh, the a previous uh, distinction between top-down and um, bottom-up approaches to um, to global climate governance. 
Okay, next question is, who can exercise formative agency? Uh, the number of actors is potentially uh, very large, um, but the ones, uh, the ones emphasized in this, this paper, this chapter, um, are, are, are not necessarily the ones who are most important when it comes to primary agency, um, that's uh, international organizations, state and corporations, uh, but, but those who are perhaps a bit more capable um, of uh, escaping from path dependencies in ideas and discourses um, and can perhaps um, uh, act in more creative um, and, ultimately more, uh, and ultimately effective fashion in an exercise informative agency. Um, all of these agents prove problematic um, in, in different ways. Um, so uh, scientists and experts um, uh, have been, well, ex extremely assertive in, in recent years um, with, with ideas such as planetary boundaries. Um, often though the efforts uh, uh, don't get the reception that, that is sought. So planet, the idea of planetary boundaries uh, proved too controversial um, to embed in the, the final declaration of um, the Rio, Rio Plus 20 conference in 2012, despite a concerted push from, from, from natural scientists, um, suggesting that, uh, uh, um, that we need to think sort of very long and hard about the kind of language that, that is used and, and the, the extent to which um, it is going to resonate. Um, planetary boundaries proved too controversial. Um, what I would argue is that uh, uh, science needs, we need to think a, a, a bit more about how to embed science more effectively in deliberative systems. Um, I may have a bit more to say, well, actually if I had more time I'd, I'd say more, but the time, time is short. Uh, the most vulnerable, why are these in, in here? These are also the least influential, but the, the, the most vulnerable to the effects of, um, of, of, of climate change and other, envir other, other, environmental, uh, other environmental risk and damage. Um, the most vulnerable, though, do have, a, do have moral authority. Um, uh, my late uh, colleague from Australia, P Val Plumwood, um, talked about the inability to, of, of dominant systems to hear the bad news from below. Um, it's the most vulnerable who ought to be in the best place to transmit that news, but often we're very bad at hearing it. Um, often what happens is that uh, uh, when the most vulnerable um, uh, lack the capacity to, to advocate on their own behalf, um, advocates, um, NGOs, um, such as Oxfam, for example, step in. Um, so, um, uh, time is running short, so I'll just, um, uh, actually, I won't say anything about the other, uh, other three, other than to, um, to, to note their existence. Um, but the general point here is that um, all formative agents have limitations. Um, the, lim the limitations are of different kinds. Um, so, uh, um, for example, actually I will go back and talk about um, the final, sorry, the, the, the fourth category on the list of formative agents. Um, norm entrepreneurs or discourse entrepreneurs. Uh, specialists in promoting social change. Um, norm entre entrepreneurs uh, do appear extensively in, in the international relations literature. Um, the, the, the concept of discourse entrepreneurs is, I think, less, less widely used. Um, but I would see uh, discourse entrepreneurs as having a broader remit than norm entrepreneurs in terms of uh, uh, not necessarily taking the institutional landscape as, as given, uh, but trying to uh, uh, reconfigure uh, the way we think about, um, about issues um, in, 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 fundament, in, in, in fundamental ways. Um, so who, who might be a discourse entrepreneur in that sense? Um, you know, Al Gore is arguably a kind of discourse entrepreneur, but not a very effective one. Um, that, uh, in the sense that he's very good at, at um, speaking to the converted, but very poor at building bridges um, to, a, a, across um, different sides in a polarized system, and arguably has, uh, uh, has uh, helped contribute to the degree of, the degree of polarization in the system. Um, I, I already mentioned Brundtland as a discourse entrepreneur. Um, uh, Pope Francis, uh, in his Laudato Si encyclical, is arguably uh, trying to reorient a, a, a religious discourse in a particular kind of environmental direction. Um, okay, so, uh, however, discourse entrepreneurs um, uh, uh, um, are often, um, well, I mean, social movement activists are often, often act as um, norm and discourse entrepreneurs, um, often very instrumentally. Okay, sorry, time is, time is running out. Um, the, 
Okay, in, in terms of um, responding to the limitations of, 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 of all kinds of formative agents, acting is important, interacting is even more so. Um, so the search is on then for systems, uh, deliberative systems, that should be, that should be able to connect um, formative agents to productive effect. Ideally, those systems should be critical and transformative rather than functional. Uh, one of the core requirements of the Anthropocene is, is reflexivity, and that requires uh, critical and transformative deliberative systems rather than just functional ones. Um, in terms of connections within such a system, uh, in, and how it would uh, link different kinds of agents, it would involve uh, uh, more effective listening on the part of human institutions to non-human nature, it would involve um, thinking about the relationship between the most vulnerable and the advocates. And here there's a literature in, uh, um, uh, in democratic representation, especially the role of non-elected representatives that can be usefully drawn on. Um, we can think about um, how uh, discourses might be represented by discourse entrepreneurs to states and international organizations. And we can also think about deliberative relationships between scientists and broader publics. So these are hints of connections between formative agents in deliberative systems um, and how they might be, uh, might be put in better transformative order in the interests of ecological reflexivity in the Anthropocene. Same questions till the end after we hear from the discussant. So our second presentation is uh, Caroline Sainan, uh, and her paper that she's presenting is "Leaving No One Behind: The Influence of Civil Society Participation on the Sustainable Development Goals." University, and I'm delighted to be here uh, today to present my research on global civil society participation in the negotiations on the SDGs. So, as most of you may know, um, one of the main pressing issues in Earth system governance is um, the democratic deficit of global policy making, and this unfolds in the lack of responsiveness of uh, global norms and institutions to collective preferences and uh, also into the lack of accountability of uh, intergovernmental organization. Um, over the years, uh, democratization of global politics uh, has become both an academic and an empirical demand. Um, there has been increased interest in uh, international relations and political science literature on global democracy and uh, scholars have uh, actually provided various paths uh, towards uh, the democratization of global politics. Um, and global democracy is also an empirical demand. It has become a highly politicized issue uh, that has mobilized uh, civil society worldwide and uh, that has resulted actually in uh, many movements and protests uh, that attest of a more uh, widely felt need for global citizenship. Um, and what both uh, academic and empirical uh, demands for democratization share is that increased civil society participation uh, in uh, the making of global norms is key. Um, <clears throat> so, over the years, uh, global organizations uh, have uh, tried to respond to such uh, demands by creating uh, civil society participatory mechanisms uh, so that civil society actors could participate in, uh, in global negotiations. But uh, after um, maybe 20 years of existence, uh, these, uh, these mechanisms have proved to be uh, quite exclusive. This is, uh, for instance, the case of the major group system that has been created after the Rio uh, 1992 summit. <clears throat> but fortunately, uh, Ben Ki-moon saved us all and uh, orchestrated what he called the most inclusive and transparent process in the history of the United Nations. 
and he talked about the, uh, uh, the negotiations on the sustainable development goals. Specifically, 10 million people uh, voiced uh, their views uh, in more than 100 consultations that have been organized either by international organizations or by governments between 2012 and 2015. But uh, I was wondering in my PhD to what extent the mechanisms for the participation of civil society in the SDGs negotiations have contributed to fostering more uh, democratic policy making at global level. And I tried to answer this question by focusing on three pivotal uh, mechanisms for civil society participation. Um, the Rio Plus 20 dialogues, the online dialogues uh, organized by UNDP and the government of Brazil. Um, the hearings of civil society uh, within the framework of uh, the Open Working Group on Sustainable Development Goals and the Global My World <coughs> Survey organized by the United Nations. And, um, well, the main takeaway of the, of the research is that uh, global civil society consultation uh, actually uh, fail uh, to effectively democratize global policy making. And there are mainly two reasons for that. Um, the first one is that global civil society consultation regularly fail to include uh, beyond the usual suspects. Um, <clears throat> actually, when you look at uh, the three consultations, um, they mostly favor the participation of highly professionalized, highly organized, uh, well-resourced civil society actors uh, uh, in comparison to um, the participation of um, a broader and, and specialized public. Um, and also, uh, they lack inclusiveness uh, because uh, participants from developed countries in these consultations are overrepresented. And this is specifically the case for the Rio online dialogues and the OWG hearings. Within these two consultations, um, I think uh, more than 76% uh, yeah, of the participants in the Rio online dialogues were. Uh, coming from developed countries and 64% uh, in the OWG hearings, uh, while this, uh, uh, the, the, the population coming from developed countries uh, uh, in, the, well, in the world only account for 17% uh, of the world population. Um, but what's interesting here, and I will come back to that later, is that um, the My World survey uh, show a reverse bias uh, towards the participation of developing countries. Uh, in, this, uh, in this consultation, 95% uh, of the participants came from developing countries. The second reason uh, why uh, global consultation um, fail to uh, make the global system more democratic is that they uh, have limited influence uh, on the negotiations. Um, I specifically looked at the, um, the effects of civil society participation on the framing of the issues uh, for the negotiations and also on the shifting uh, of the positions of key governments. And I found that uh, with respect to issue framing, um, civil society uh, interventions uh, failed to uh, uh, move away uh, uh, the framing of the issue uh, in the negotiations. I specifically looked at uh, one goal uh, and one target, which is the income inequality target. And they failed, uh, despite repeated interventions, civil society actors failed to, uh, uh, to move away, uh, well, to, to make... Um, uh, to, to move away the framing uh, of, uh, of income inequality um, as a matter of uh, both uh, uh, reducing poverty and extreme wealth. Um, and also they had uh, limited uh, influence uh, on the shifting of positions of government. Um, in fact, civil society action uh, provided additional arguments uh, to delegations uh, in order for them to threaten their position, uh, but they didn't really shift uh, their position. Uh, position shifting uh, really uh, happens 
uh, as a result of political trade-off uh, in the final hours of the negotiations and not that much as a result of civil society action. Um, however, we can say that civil society was uh, successful, was influential in the sense that uh, their interventions contributed to ensure the existence of several SDGs in the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development. And this was the case for SDG 10 uh, on reduced inequalities, uh, SDG 11 on sustainable cities and communities, uh, of SDG 13 on climate action, and uh, SDG 16 on peace, justice, and strong institution. But however, if we look uh, into more detail, civil society interventions uh, failed to secure ambitious targets uh, within these goals. And here again, I looked at uh, uh, the income inequality target, and um, civil society um, uh, failed, uh, failed to provide a quantification of the targets, uh, despite uh, their many interventions that called for um, uh, reducing income uh, growth of the, um, achieving income growth of the bottom 40% uh, uh, by a set amount per year. And uh, also, um, civil society failed, well, the target only uh, focuses on uh, the bottom 40% of the population, but it ignores the top 10% uh, of the population, and, and this could actually lead to a greater concentration of, uh, of wealth in uh, the highest income quintiles. Um, and so when, um, when trying to, um, to find an explanation uh, in these uh, variation uh, in inclusiveness and influence of uh, different uh, civil society participatory processes, I found that uh, the design uh, of participation is a key variable. Um, first of all, uh, if we look uh, at the use of uh, ICT, uh, in a civil society consultation. Um, we see that although uh, the internet uh, is a low-cost horizontal means of communication that transcends the barriers of space and time, its use in civil society consultations uh, does not necessarily uh, increase and foster inclusiveness. Um, this was specifically the case of the Rio Dialogues uh, that we produced uh, that reproduce uh, <coughs> similar participatory biases than face-to-face uh, -face participation that was uh, held uh, uh, in the United Nations headquarters in New York. Um, <coughs> second, um, in terms of design, uh, the financial and human resources uh, are also important, uh, but not in the way we think. Um, Actually, if we take the example of the MyWall survey, limited financial and human resources uh, do not uh, necessarily hamper inclusiveness. Um, in the case of the MyWall survey, what, they, what the commissioners of the consultation did is that they, well, they had limited resources, and, but they, um, they, they, um, uh, they based uh, their, uh, their consultations on uh, uh, multiple partners uh, at uh, national and local level and uh, they delegated uh, the, uh, the consultation and the dissemination of the consultation to these partners uh, in order to reach uh, the, the most uh, marginalized uh, people. Uh, also, another uh, variable uh, in terms of design is the timing in the negotiation cycle, but this is this is not uh, really surprising. Uh, uh, a longer consultation and uh, the earlier it's organized in the negotiation process, uh, the more inclusive and uh, perhaps influential uh, the consultation will be. Um, and finally, what I found uh, quite uh, interesting is that um, uh, we can say that there is uh, an inclusiveness influence paradox uh, this, well, I, I found in my results that um, civil society influence uh, is higher when, uh, when civil society engages 
uh, in uh, participatory spaces that are informal and therefore uh, that are quite uh, exclusive. So in the end, um, what I'm, well, in the end, uh, 10 million voices in a global survey, uh, like my world, have had far less impact on the negotiations than the uh, persistent lobbying of a handful of professionalized civil society actors that are uh, well acquainted uh, with the political dynamics of uh, intergovernmental negotiation in the UN. And I will stop there. Thanks very much, Bob. Uh, can everyone hear me okay? Okay, great. Thanks a lot. Um, yeah, so, well, John in his presentation already mentioned the idea of planetary boundaries and no doubt it'll be very familiar as a concept to um, us. Oh, um, I'll just give a very brief recap just for the purposes of the, the talk today. So, uh, so you'd be pretty familiar, I imagine, with um, this, this diagram which has um, become rather iconic. This is an updated um, version of the planetary boundaries that were originally presented in a paper by um, Johan Rockström and colleagues. Um, so also Person, who sends her apologies for today, um, she was an author on the original um, planetary boundaries paper and we've worked on um, this, this new paper together. And um, so the, the, the basic idea of the, the boundaries, I'll explain this as best as I can, um, it's not here, is um, that uh, you have certain types of um, certain types of biophysical processes that are uh, critical to the functioning of the Earth system, <clears throat> and then uh, certain types of control variables are associated with them, like atmospheric concentration of CO two. This is a climate change example, um, and then certain types of um, uh, thresholds or tipping points that could occur in result. Um, as a result of increasing climate change, and then uh, this planetary boundary proposed by um, the, the authors of the proposal, 350 plus million CO2. And similar processes for a number of other um, boundaries um, uh, uh, indicated in the diagram. Okay, so um, the, the idea itself has had a fair bit of impact in a number of policy communities. Um, we've seen some national governments uh, take an interest in the idea. This is um, something from the Swiss government uh, recently. And you may also be familiar with Kate Rayworth's variation of the, uh, the planetary boundaries, uh, the donut. Um, so whereas the, the original proposal set out what uh, it called a, a safe operating space for, for humanity, the, um, the idea of the donut is to map out a safe and just um, operating space for humanity by introducing social foundations as well as environmental ceilings. So despite these, um, uh, the, some degree of influence, the idea has had attracted its fair share of critiques. I won't go into the, the scientific critiques, but I'll uh, talk to today a bit more about the political critiques, and in particular those that have argued that um, the, the idea or the way that it's been presented in public debate somehow uh, lacks uh, democratic legitimacy. So I'll say a little bit about those critiques first and then present a way of reconceptualising planetary boundaries and then look at what that says for um, implications for the division of labour among citizens, policy makers and experts in governing uh, risks to the Earth system. So very briefly, the, the first type of democratic critique, um, one of the, the most common ones that, that comes up, we call preference incompatibility, but essentially it's the idea that uh, planetary boundaries are incompatible with the actual preferences that citizens hold, and in particular uh, that these boundaries set unwarranted um, constraints on the aspirations of the global south. 
So here we see some echoes of the limits to growth debates of the 1970s. And both of these debates, the, the planetary boundaries and limits to growth um, debates, um, raise what uh, James K. Wong calls the dilemma of green democracy, which is, is it possible to safeguard democratic processes at the same time as ensuring environmental outcomes, uh, pro-environmental or green outcomes? What if people just don't care enough about the environment uh, to, to, um, to want to adopt in environmental limits, ecological limits? I should say we're seeing uh, boundaries here planetary boundaries as a, as a variation of ecological limits, that's something that obviously we can, um, we can discuss. Um, so a further concern, which is one that we'll focus on in the paper, is that planetary boundaries represent a technocratic um, top-down approach to governing risks to, to the Earth system. And so this is captured in a um, comment by Ms. Melissa Leach from a, a few years ago, or the concern at least, when she asked whether the Anthropocene and its associated concepts of planetary boundaries might lead to a dangerous new world of undisputed scientific authority and anti-democratic politics. The third concern is about the rigidity of the, the framework. I won't go into this too much um, today, but um, we could come back to it in, in, question, uh, in question time. So really the motivation for the paper was to look at, well, can these, can these critiques be addressed? Is there, is there a way that we can understand this concept and um, its potential um, uh, influence on um, global governance in a way that is democratically legitimate? In order to do so, we draw in part on literature on deliberative democracy and also in our research on, um, from science and technology studies and philosophy of science about um, democratising expertise. And the deliberative conception here helps us to, um, to, to, to pick up, well, we, we find it useful for this purpose, partly because um, it embodies the idea that um, people who are um, affected by ecological risks should be entitled to participate in decision making about governing those risks. But the deliberative aspect also um, emphasises the, the importance of reason giving and justification, which can help to inform a division of labour between citizens, um, policy makers and experts who may um, all be able to offer different kinds, kinds of reasons and justifications. So we begin by um, situating planetary boundaries um, as a boundary object, an idea that been familiar to many of you from science and technology studies. Um, so, um, we, so, so, um, uh, an object that, that straddles both science and policy and allows a degree of collaboration while maintaining a diversity of views. Um, and this idea has been applied by more so our colleagues in relation to global, uh, global goals. Um, and then we turn to unpacking the components of the, the, the idea of planetary boundaries. So we try to see, well, what can we make of the original definition from Rockstrom and colleagues of planetary boundaries? The Earth system processes and associated thresholds which, if crossed, could generate unacceptable environmental change. So we argue it's possible to, to distinguish a biophysical component relating to the Earth system processes and an overlapping normative component which is captured in this idea of unacceptable environmental change. And we can also talk further about the, the degree of the overlap um, there. But the definition of itself, uh, in itself doesn't um, necessarily capture what constitutes unacceptable. Um, is it moving us out of Holocene conditions? Well, not necessarily. That's one interpretation of it. But if we boil it down to a fairly basic def definition and leave open this question of what's unacceptable, that opens up the concept more to, uh, further to deliberative con contestation. Then we need to look at, well, what does this mean? If we have this this um, multi-component idea of planetary boundaries, what does this mean for the division of labour amongst um, different groups? So obviously once um, value judgments come into play, it is clear that um, 
planetary boundaries can't rely alone on scientific evidence, but need to rely, um, need to be informed by societal values about risks um, and what's acceptable and what's unacceptable. So there's one uh, one way of of looking at the um, the, the the division of labour, which um, is presented by um, Edenhofer and Kovash in a, um, some recent papers. They're looking particularly at the IPCC, but make some broader arguments about how this, the science policy influence, uh, interface works. So they make this argument that we can see experts as map makers um, that set out different options that society could take, and um, society as uh, navigators amongst the different options. This is not a strictly sort of um, one um, group deals with the facts, one group deals with the values, but a, a somewhat different way of looking at the division of labour. So, so in that case, um, let's say the IPCC maps out different types of societal pathways or different concentrations and so on um, that are, that are um, consistent with various forms of emissions and then society might choose um, different types of, of pathways. But if we apply this to the planetary boundaries pr pr um, framework, we see that what um, the authors of the planetary boundaries proposal have done is actually uh, rather a bit more of this. So we can extend this analogy a bit further to say that, well, actually, um, they're, they're not... Well, so the, the authors weren't just setting out a range of options. They were um, proposing a specific boundary, 350 parts per million, um, and so on. Um, and so we can see them as sign posters um, setting out um, warning signs about risks to the Earth system. We argue that this role, which is um, going beyond the role of uh, a map maker, um, is consistent with, the, with um, an argument that scientists may play different roles um, in a democratic society, uh, whether we think of them in terms of issue advocates, as Roger Pilker Jr. Um, calls them, or, or in other terms, um, thanks. Yep. Um, but that this is consistent with the the, um, the freedom for experts to voice um, views that are consistent with their normative convi convictions, provided that they are transparent about the assumptions that they base um, their claims on. All right. So far, so good. But then, what what does this mean about? Um, setting planetary boundaries or defining planetary boundaries themselves. So we might think, well, um, so society also sets warning, si uh, warning signs. Maybe in terms of the two degree goal, it may be less, um, less stringent than what, um, the, what has been argued for by scientists. Maybe it, it could be more stringent. So how, how do we see the, this role of scientists and society um, in relation to planetary boundaries? So here we can draw on other, um, uh, other policy um, contexts which have looked at ecological, which have dealt with ecological limits, in particular the idea of critical loads uh, from the transboundary air pollution uh, context. So uh, here, and Karen Backstrand has written a, a paper on this, uh, a ch chapter on this recently, she distinguishes between uh, critical loads for what ecosystems can withstand which are defined by scientists, and then target loads, which were what policymakers um, set, um, which were sometimes consistent with critical loads set by um, experts, sometimes uh, more or less stringent. So we might say, well, okay, so scientists, experts propose or define um, planetary boundaries, then society sets goals um, or targets. So they're, they're rather different things. Another type of model, and sorry I'm skipping through this rather quickly because I really don't want to take up um, too much of our time. Another perhaps integrated model is to say, well actually what policymakers are doing is also setting planetary boundaries. It's just, well, their boundaries might be different to Rockstrom and Al's boundaries, but it's still a joint um, process of setting boundaries. Um, so that's another, another possibility. A third one, which we think is perhaps a little bit more promising, is to say, well, there are still distinctive roles for, uh, for, ex for, for scientific um, inquiry and policy making, um, but we can, we, we can still see that there is something different about 
these, um, these processes. So we might say, well, okay, scientists may well propose planetary boundaries, obviously through a dialogue between experts and society, but society sets a particular type of goals and, and these are goals that are specifically related to risks to the Earth system as a whole um, and based on a view about what is an unacceptable risk. In which case we could see things like the two degree goal as, as uh, planetary goals we might say, which uh, work at that Earth system level are uh, informed by understandings of unacceptable risk. They may not be explicitly called planetary boundaries, but they're nevertheless informed by these concerns about risk to the Earth system. And this might help to um, this might help to deal with some of these concerns about the discourse of planetary boundaries. I should um, mention that I think this term planetary goals only t um, emerged over um, the conversation at lunch. So I think it's uh, maybe I think it's maybe um, James Meadowcroft's. Um, I have to thank for, for that idea, I can't remember. Um, okay. So very briefly uh, to, to wrap up, whichever of these models we, we choose, given this, um, the normative element of planetary boundaries, it's clear that there needs to be uh, a democratic process uh, for setting um, goals in, um, in dialogue uh, with understandings about the Earth system. I put up here a few possibilities for linking citizens, policy makers and, and experts um, in order to ensure uh, that scientific work um, in this area is informed by societal values about risks and also to ensure that political processes are more are better informed by um, scientific knowledge as well. Um, in the interest of time, I won't go into this. Um, I just want to conclude with, with one last point, which is uh, that planetary boundaries is a bit of a hornet's nest. A lot of people have reservations about the ideas and particularly the democratic um, aspects of the democratic credentials of it. But if we go back to this um, idea of the safe and just operating space, one possibility is thinking of, well, the social foundations um, are a kind of boundary um, often associated with human rights, let's say, the right to food, the right to water, which are a form of boundary against inhumane treatment. So these are often seen as preconditions of, for democracy. Perhaps we can see planetary boundaries um, in a similar light as preconditions for democracy as well. But obviously we need to continue the conversation further. So thanks very much. Thanks for having me on as discussion. I just wanted to stir the pot for a few minutes. I know I've got a relatively short amount of time so that we have uh, plenty of time for discussion. Um, so I, I'll start with um, the Pickering in Person paper. Um, so just a, 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 a short recap and then some questions. Um, so uh, they want to rehabilitate the planetary boundaries idea from the technocracy critique, um, that it leaves too little space for democracy. And what they propose instead is a kind of dialogic process between um, science and values or between policymakers or, or citizens and, and scientists, um, where at the end there may still be a kind of boundary, but it's a softened boundary, maybe a recommended boundary or one that's more legitimate because it's chosen democratically rather than set uh, through scientific processes. Um, and uh, here in the context of climate change, for example, um, science is seen as leaving open questions of how much risk is acceptable, uh, but contributing in ways in which the decision about uh, risk management is made on a more scientific basis. So some questions then. Um, what we didn't see in, in Jonathan's presentation of the uh, paper was a, a fairly neat and orderly process by which science started at the top and led fairly directly in a linear fashion uh, to governments deciding to act on risk, ultimately adopting a two degree temperature target. Um, and it would be great, if, of course, if the process always worked well this way, but suppose that uh, more governments were like mine in the United States, um, where uh, governments decided to just disregard 
science-based risk assessments or to not act on them, or suppose just hypothetically the governments were to get to that final stage of adopting a temperature target uh, and then uh, made commitments uh, to acting on climate change that didn't add up to the two degrees that they endorsed. Uh, what then? Um, do we have boundaries any longer? And then just generally, does the, does the argument rely too much on assumptions that the democracy will follow or be responsive uh, to, to science so that the conflict between science and democracy goes away? Um, does it assume that that is, uh, to use a concept from another paper, assume too much influence of science on democracy, and what if that influence doesn't exist empirically? And to get to a point that Jonathan made at the end of this presentation, why not just constrain democracy uh, in ways that depend on something like human rights? This is an approach that Simon Caney has, has taken to say, certain kinds of risks are just unacceptable, not because they're based on scientific boundaries, but because they transcend or transgress human rights. Uh, so I thought I'd, I'd tackle the Dreisig Pickering paper second. Um, so this, as, as you heard, um, emphasizes formative agency uh, within uh, international environmental governance um, and uh, depends uh, on an example or uses an example to try and illustrate the role of formative agency in biodiversity politics, uh, where as uh, in the paper it's told in a little bit more salacious way, um, ecologists and philosophers came to some uh, fairly happy agreement about the value of healthy ecosystems and uh, developed the ideas that were central to the CBD. Uh, and then economists came on the scene and, and screwed everything up by commodifying nature. Um, and this um, sort of happens in a lot of different kinds of contexts. And the question here, um, were, there, were there formative agents that were missing from this conversation or, or maybe more to the point, did economists dominate uh, in a way that their formative agency uh, uh, pushed out formative agency from other kinds of actors. Are hegemonic discourses like economic ones uh, a problem for ecological democracy of, of this kind? Um, a couple other questions or observations from the, uh, from the Dreisig and Pickering paper. Uh, so at the very end of the discussion of the CBD, uh, there was just a, a one sentence mention of uh, a fairly important structural constraint within the treaty. Um, that is that uh, countries were given full sovereignty over the biodiversity within their borders. Um, and this wouldn't be presumably subject to renegotiation or reflexivity. Is there any room for agency when structure operates in that fairly tightly controlled manner that would seem to prohibit uh, a lot of that kind of agency that seemed to be important to that story? Um, there's a question about the, the speed of the process as well that I'd like to at least pose. Um, so in the paper, uh, John and, and Jonathan point to the processes of norm accretion and cascade, um, where they use examples of slavery and colonialism, where um, attitudes and values build up over long periods of time. Uh, and then action is very quick um, after perhaps you know, decades or even centuries. Uh, and they, they cite this as being a potential path by which climate change uh, norms might also lead to Similarly, quick change, but the question to pose is just, do we have that sort of time for norm accretion uh, to lead to some kind of norm cascade there? Uh, two more quick questions. Uh, so it calls for more direct advocacy by uh, the world's uh, vulnerable or disadvantaged um, and not through intermediaries uh, and NGOs that might represent those interests. And here I just hold that recommendation up to some of the findings of the Senate paper, which um, suggested that um, perhaps the world's uh, disadvantage might be especially uninfluential, um, that it seems to be elites that have the most influence over processes like these. Um, so where does that leave us uh, if we're recommending uh, particularly uninfluential forms of uh, um, this sort of agency? And then um, that's a neat paper finally. Um, so interesting paper, more empirical paper obviously on the role of influence in civil society discourse around the Sustainable Development Goals. And where influence is really, I think, understood in the same kinds of discursive terms as we saw in the first couple of papers, um, that it's, it appears in frames that operates through both formal and informal democratic spaces. Um, and the, the findings of the paper are, of course, quite discouraging, I would think, for the other two visions of ecological democracy, which seem a bit more optimistic about its prospects. Um, there's little influence. Um, over the sustainable development goals, framing and shaping of the process. 
Uh, and what influence there was seemed to be exercised by elites within the process rather than um, uh, more, you might think, democratic actors within civil society. So some questions here. Um, this may be a more methodolo methodological question, but is there a way to chart earlier stages of influence besides the kind that gets um, that appears as uptake in the policy process uh, that might suggest something about it appearing in the form of norm accretion or leading to norm cascades. Um, uh, uh, um, you don't treat scientists as a civil society group. Both uh, the other two papers took scientists as playing an important role in ecological democracy. Would this matter uh, in the way that the... Uh, the understanding of influence was charted in your empirical findings. Um, the, there's a claim in here about uh, global governance developing a, uh, to, and to quote, a culture of openness and participation. Uh, it implies maybe that there's a, an additional value beyond influence uh, for ecological democracy. What is this? Is it, is it legitimacy maybe? Um, is there an issue of then co-optation of that democratic participation role within the SDG process at least. And then the final question, and I'll wrap up with this. Um, so given the, the finding overall uh, that the less formal spaces were more influential, which made it uh, the elites within global civil society that seemed to have more influence, um, is there a way to make civil society more accountable to the global public and especially elites within that civil society? Um, and then how does this fit with uh, the commendation uh, in the Dreisach and Pickering paper of the discourse entrepreneurs, which I would take to be more elite-driven intermediaries rather than direct voices or channels of direct uh, participation in global environmental governance. Uh, but in general, three great papers, really interesting conversation, I think, between them. Great. Thank you, Steve. What we could do, what we could do, is uh, let the presenters have a, a, a very brief opportunity for uh, uh, commenting, uh, if they would like, uh, either on the uh, discussants' remarks uh, or perhaps uh, on uh, the relevance of the other papers to, uh, to, to to their own. Okay, I'll just I'll just be very very brief um, and just pick out uh, the, the, um, uh, the 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 last um, the, the last comment that Steve made on the. Uh, on the uh, on on my paper with Jonathan, um, direct participation in the disadvantaged uh, in a context where, um, as 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 Carl Anne's paper uh, showed, I mean, it, it does seem to be that elites do dominate within civil society. Um, uh, yes, that that's uh, I mean that that's that, that's a real problem, a real, a real challenge. And I suppose there are there are two ways of, of thinking about uh, how to. Involve the most disadvantaged as more effective, uh, more effective uh, formative agents. Um, one would rest on um, one would re rest on uh, dominant civil society actors. So uh, um, there's a, a book um, uh, that's either it's about to be published, I think, or it's just been published by Laura, Laura Montanera, which um, the, the title is um, "Who Elected Oxfam?" and that's a—I mean—that's a question that's been asked many times before, and even used as a title before in different um, in, in different in different pieces. Um, uh, but, but in it, she develops the idea of um, of, uh, of well, when is when is the kind of representation, the kind of advocacy that Oxfam engages in um, legitimate? Um, to what extent um, is Oxfam a legitimate legitimate representation of the world representative of the world's poor? And her basic argument is that it, um, it's incumbent upon Oxfam not to substitute. Um, substitute as a representative body for the world's poor, um, but rather to, um, to well, while doing that, to increase the capacity of the poor themselves to participate directly um, in, in processes of global governance. Um, and so, uh, so that's one way of thinking about it. And uh, I did, I did mention, I mean, in, in my in my presentation, I, I just talked about it more briefly in more abstract terms in terms of the relationship between. Uh, um, between the most vulnerable and their advocates within deliberative systems. So that's, um, that, that, that's one way to think about it. So Oxfam really should be engaged in those capacity building exercises. But the other way, um, the other way to think about it is, um, is, is more um, di direct participation. Um, and this wasn't in the, this, this wasn't in, in the paper, but I've um, uh, been involved with a group of other people in developing a, a proposal to the, um, the current um, uh, 
Global Challenges Prize for a new model of global governance, um, and in that we, we do have some suggestions for um, uh, how, to, uh, how to involve um, direct participation of the most disadvantaged in the process of global governance. And that um, would, um, uh, uh, um, would, could involve um, uh, uh, targeted, uh, uh, yeah, targeted selection to participate um, in deliberative forums. Um, we, we go into the details, uh, but, it, but, it, but it can be done. Um, and there are, there, there are well, we have examples, um, at least at the local level, of the most disadvantaged being very capable deliberators, given the, given the chance, and, and very capable participants, and so capable formative agents. So, anyway. Thanks a lot, Steve, for your comments. And uh, just a very uh, quick response on the um, yeah, um, point about the sort of the messy world of politics and, well, the US and others perhaps uh, not uh, getting anywhere near um, uh, the planetary boundaries idea. And so I guess the, the idea that, um, that behind our paper, what we hope to do was to, to explore that question of, well, is it even possible in principle that um, this, this idea of planetary boundaries could be um, seen in some democratically legitimate fashion. So it certainly wasn't um, to, to say that, well, um, processes to um, reflect planetary boundaries in, in governance will necessarily be um, democratic. Maybe there are some of the so statements by some of the proponents that, you know, say that they're non-negotiable or whatever that maybe are, are actually not consistent with a democratically legitimate understanding of the, of the boundaries. But once we have an idea of, I suppose, the possibility of that legitimacy, then um, it means we can assess actual um, processes against some sorts of standards. Um, so um, if, that, if that sort of makes sense. Um, <laughs> we can talk about it. Okay. <clears throat> Thank you for, for your comments. Um, I just want to... Uh, Two, two, two ideas uh, to try to make my, uh, yeah, my paper a bit more positive, uh, so that you can leave the room uh, without, uh, <laughs> with hope. Um, <clears throat> uh, first, uh, what the what these global consultations I think uh, have, um, well, they they, they had uh, influence on. Uh, on future procedures for civil society participation in global uh, in global environmental governance, uh, I think they really uh, cultivate uh, well, they foster uh, culture of participation uh, in in global uh, in global policy making. Um, and also another uh, more positive conclusion uh, is that um, even though uh, most of these. Um, Formal consultations, uh, such as the My World Survey, uh, uh, didn't have uh, impact on the definition of the goals. Um, I think that they uh, still had impacts uh, on the populations, uh, on the most uh, disadvantaged populations that did participate in, in, in the survey uh, by um, raising their awareness uh, on the SDGs. Um, and I think uh, they um, contributed to um, build um, some uh, of the democratic skills of these uh, populations. Uh, and um, uh, perhaps this will, uh, I hope, foster their participation at local and perhaps national level uh, when it comes to uh, SDGs implementation. Um, and also uh, to, uh, to come back to uh, the question on uh, how to involve uh, direct participation of uh, the most marginalized. Um, I think uh, that uh, there <coughs> are also um, um, initiatives that, ha uh, that have been uh, organized at global level uh, back in 2010 and 2015. Uh, it's called the Worldwide Views uh, on, on, on Biodiversity in 2010 and on Climate Change in 2015. And, uh, well, they consisted of uh, uh, many <coughs> different uh, deliberative forums taking place uh, in, in different countries at the same time uh, involving lay citizens and uh, giving them a voice in, in, in climate and, uh, and biodiversity uh, negotiations. 
Okay, well, we have time for questions. Yes. Hi, a uh, very really interesting paper. So, I'm Peter Hackes from the uh, University of Central Florida. Uh, so I spent a lot of time studying climate denial and organized project, uh, largely from conservative forces. Um, and it, it strikes me that uh, part of the deliberate democracy work um, uh, could uh, help me if, it, if there was a sense of how that uh, how that process works with undemocratic forces. So um, you know, and I say that the Times denial is undemocratic because it's based largely on deceit. But um, at the same time, uh, one of you know part of the process of uh, over the course of years uh, in our studies, we show uh, that this denial is largely elite-led at first, but then, at least in the United States, becomes a populist movement, and people are um, easily convinced that non-experts are experts. So um, these the, uh, these folks have, uh, you know, I, one question I wonder is, does that imply the need for some sort of vanguard, not a vanguard class, but maybe vanguard intellectuals, or, <laughs> uh, that, you know, who the experts are isn't necessarily obvious to civil society or to, to, to people, and then, and then we can see that they've been easily deceived, unfortunately. Related question, Karen Siegel, University of Glasgow. I have a pretty similar idea, not all civil society organizations or movements are necessarily ecological or democratic. Um, and I was wondering for uh, Caroline, if um, you had any evidence of that in the consultation. So were there also civil society voices saying, no, we don't want to include climate change because we don't believe in it or we don't want to include gender equality or you know, any, any of the other things? <laughs> Let's address those questions and maybe some more in, in reverse order. Um, <clears throat> uh, yeah, that, that's a good uh, that, that's a good question. Um, I, to the best of my knowledge, I didn't I didn't have evidence on uh, the participation of these groups uh, in the in the in the negotiations of the Open Working Group on the SDGs. Uh, I think that. Um, um, the, um, the organizations that participate in these negotiations are um, almost uh, all progressive uh, in terms of their, uh, their ideals, I would say. Yeah. Oh, um. <laughs> <laughs> okay, on the question of... Um, Climate change, climate change denial, uh, and, its, and its place in, in deliberative process. Um, I, th I think there's, t there's at least two ways to think about this. Um, I think at the, the sort of the most um, abstract level of, of normative theory. Um, uh, in, in general, we think of inclusion as one as a, as a core democratic principle, um, but uh, but inclusion doesn't have to be unconditional. Um, for those of the for the for in inclusion doesn't have to extend to those uh, trying to undermine um, effective processes of, um, of, of democratic liberation, and that's uh, in the case of organised uh, climate change. No, that's exactly um, that, that's exactly how it, how it how it began as a, as a very very uh, coordinated um, uh, uh, m movement dri driven by um, driven by some. Uh, very, by, by fossil fuel companies, by, by the Koch brothers in the US um, in, in particular. Um, just the abstract, dormant, the, 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 the abstract level. The problem is, one, okay, but what happens once denial gets uh, more embedded uh, as a, as a, um, in, in, in populist movements and, 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 and elsewhere? And then, then, it's, then it's a bit trickier. I mean, it's, it, it's very, it, you can't do so well. Okay, it's, it's simply. Um, ruled out as a legitimate democratic position, um, and that's where I think um, uh, we can think about uh, uh, the role of different sorts of rhetoric um, in reaching across divides and potentially even reaching uh, reaching people who are climate change deniers. And denial comes in many shades and many forms. Um, 
and sort of overlaps with, 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 with skepticism. And, and not all of them are necessarily sort of completely hard line um, and unreachable. And so it is possible to think about um, the, the possibility of um, rhetoric in bridging across difference and helping to create uh, effective deliber deliberative systems. And so I've, I've actually got a paper on that published in, in Environmental Politics a couple of years ago with um, Alex Lowe, which gives, a, um, which gives an example of how that might be done. Sorry. Um, thank you. That was, uh, those were three really interesting papers. Um, sorry, my name is Bree Van Bieden. I'm at Durham University in England. Um, of course, we've talked quite a bit about participation, inclusion, representation of um, different people. How do we include those? Who cannot participate, and I'm <coughs> talking there in terms of um, perhaps people, sort of current generations, or people of pure capacities, but both future generations and non-human actors. So, how do we include those in the concept of ecological democracy? Maybe ask the question, and then I'll come to off at Ten Hill. We've got uh, four more minutes at the moment, and just uh, however much answer fits, we'll hear. Uh, Tobias Nielsen, uh, London University. A little bit related question is, could you elaborate for John and Jonathan, could you elaborate more about how you connect the, the different forms of agents overcoming their limitations? Okay, so you have uh, three and a half minutes. Okay, <laughs> thanks. Um, yeah, just perhaps on the first question about the extension of ecological democracy, I mean, uh, that's, that's been something that, um, say, Robin Eckersley and others have, have um, done to, to um, extend this idea of effectiveness and um, that, that um, concerns of those affected need to be taken into account to yeah, non-humans, future generations, um, and, and, and so on. Um, in, in practical terms, I mean, um, let's say in future generations, there are the various proposals about you know, commissioners for future generations um, and the like. Um, things like some of the sort of foresight um, and futures thinking that um, has been discussed at the conference is potentially another way in which um, interests of future generations or perspectives um, can come into play, bearing in mind the difficulty of knowing what future generations will, um, will, will, will be like. In, in, um, another example would just be, um, I was at the, uh, the conference of the parties for the Convention on Biological Diversity um, last year and um, you know, the, the, uh, the Global Youth Bi and Biodiversity Network, for example, um, played quite an important role in highlighting the perspective of youth, but also um, saw themselves as sort of advocates for future generations as well. And um, some of the other organisations there um, were advocating on behalf of ecosystems and so on. So, you know, there are, there are possibilities recognising that there are also some limitations in knowing the interests of those, um, those groups. Yeah, uh, actually, just just say on, on the, the first question about on, on those who can't participate directly. Um, democracy in general and deliberative democracy in particular, um, they're, they're not just about um, giving voice; they're also about listening. Um, and so there is, uh, so so I think uh, it's important to think uh, about uh, the capacity of, of different uh, democratic institutions and practices to to listen effectively, um, to well, especially to. Uh, to, to signals emanating from, from the non-human world. We're uh, very good at devising um, institutions which, um, which, uh, which, which, which uh, generate feedback, which reinforces their own necessity, but systematically avoids uh, listening to anything from the, from the non-human world. Um, so there is a question of, there are ways of um, thinking about institutional design there. Um, we have a bit of evidence um, uh, that deliberative, deliberative forums uh, uh, can be relatively good at, uh, at uh, rec recognising the interests of those not present, and that, include, that includes future generations. Um, connecting different agents, well that, that's an enormous question, uh, and that, that's actually the next the chapter of the book after, after this one. Um, but uh, I, I did give uh, just a few examples of, um, of particular, kind of, particular kinds of connections um, in, a, in a liberal system. So between, for example, the most vulnerable and their advocates, um, then we can think about the relationship between um, advocates, if we're thinking of them as discourse entrepreneurs, and uh, um, and 
sort of more, more established institutions such as um, state international organizations. So there is, yeah, there, there is much to be said about those linkages, but I'm not sure what I can say in uh, actually no time at all, according to my watch. <laughs> And with that, uh, we'll call this session to a close. Uh, the next series of panels starts in 10 minutes. There is another ecological democracy panel for those of you who uh, can't get enough of it. Um, I think it's just in the, yeah, in the next room.